Welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry, and today we have another top 10 list for you all. Today I'm going to be sharing my top 10 abstracted Euros. Last time I talked about my top 10 thematic Euro games, and today I'm going to be doing quite the opposite. Now, to be clear, I am not going to be covering pure abstract strategy games. These are games that actually have a theme, and in many cases, a very interesting theme. However, for whatever reason, at least as far as I'm concerned, there is a disconnect between the theme and the mechanisms, although these games are all very enjoyable, mechanically speaking. So without any further ado, let's get straight to the list with my number 10. My number 10 abstracted Euro is Patchwork, designed by Uwe Rosenberg and published by Lookout Games. And some people will argue that this game is just a pure, straight-up abstract strategy game, but I'm going to say it's not because supposedly... There is a theme of quilting here and players are uh, making their quilts and they have their boards and they're gathering all these different patches in order to cover up that board. But again, you don't necessarily feel like you are quilting. And also, for me personally, this is not necessarily the most interesting of themes, which is why it makes it onto this category as opposed to thematic Euro games. And this game, from a gameplay perspective, is such a fun game. Players take turns uh, paying for these different uh, polyomino shaped tiles to place on their own individual boards, which represents their quilt. And these polyomino shaped pieces are trying to cover as much ground as possible on your main player board and you always have the choice of three different tiles that you can purchase based on where the meeple or the pawn that you move around the board is and you have to purchase these and they all have a different varying amount of cost or value and it all de depends on their shape right because a more complex shape perhaps will be a little bit cheaper because it's going to be harder to figure it out or how many spaces it covers. If a tile covers lots of spaces, it's going to be very valuable for the players. And it has a second currency that you're factoring in, which is time. Each tile that you purchase has a certain time value to it, a time that you pay by advancing on the time track. And the time track not only determines turn order because the person who's furthest back on the time track is always going to be the current player. No matter how many turns in a row they might go, they will always be the active player. But also, once you make it to the very end of the time track, you are done. You will have no more turns in this game. And all the, the other player behind you might get another two or three turns to pick up the scraps afterwards. So that's something you have to factor in, the time that it takes to uh, purchase a particular tile. The final thing that you will see on a tile, the determining factor for purchase, is a certain amount of button symbols because each of these tiles has either uh, one button symbol or two button symbols, three button symbols. Some of them don't have any. And the buttons are basically your currency in the game. This is how you're buying those tiles in the future. And every so often you have a scoring or a uh, income phase that's triggered when you make it to a certain threshold on the time track. And once you do, you generate money in buttons equal to the amount of buttons that you have in your entire player board. So again, a tile that has a good amount of buttons it becomes very, very valuable in and of itself. So you're factoring all these things in. Again, very fun from a gameplay perspective. But seriously, quilts? I'm not feeling it. My number 10 abstracted Euro game of all time, Patrick. My number 9 abstracted Euro game is... Alhambra, designed by Dirk Hen and published uh, by Queen Games. And in this game, players are basically 13th century master builders who are working to build their Alhambra, comprised of pavilions and towers and gardens and pools and all these different types of buildings in order to have the best looking or most valuable Alhambra. I don't even know. <laughs> Essentially, in this game, you're drafting these different colored coded tiles. And it's kind of like a stock market mechanism because you're having these scoring rounds are going to take place there's three scoring rounds throughout the game and you're always going to score based on whether or not you have the majority in these particular colors and each of the different colors uh differ as far as value for example the purple is more valuable than the green which is more valuable than the white which is more valuable than the brown and as you progress in these scoring rounds, then you get additional benefits for secondary and tertiary amounts within those respective colors. But on top of all that, you have to be able, there's like a spatial element to it because you're placing these tiles in your Alhambra, in your main uh, player area, and you have specific and very strict 
placement rules that you have to follow in particular with the walls uh some of these tiles have m one or multiple walls on it and you have to factor all of these in when you're drafting a tile because a tile might be valuable to you because of its color however you might not have a legal place where you can place it on on your player area so that's something to factor in also you have this market the coolest thing about this game is this market here they are placed randomly on these four different mar markets which have four different colors of their own and these represent the currencies the color currencies that you need to use in order to purchase these cards and throughout the game you're drafting these currency cards that correspond with the different colors of the market and to purchase a card from a market you have to use colors or, or cards of that particular color but you also have to equal or surpass its price you do not make change so for any reason you overpay for a tile too bad so sad now if you do find a way if you're crafty and and thrifty enough to purchase one of these tiles for the exact amount, the exact worth of that tile, then the game rewards you by giving you an additional bonus action on that turn. Because typically, you only have one action per turn. But if you're able to purchase one or multiple uh, tiles at its exact value, then you will be rewarded with additional actions. And that's one of the coolest features of this game, which again, makes it so fun from a gameplay perspective. As far as the theme is concerned, I always forget what the heck it's about. My number nine, Abstracted Euro of all time, Alhambra. Now we move on to my number nine, Abstracted Euro of all time, and that is Blue Moon City, designed by Reiner Knizia, and this edition here published by Command Games. And Reiner Knizia is the king of the abstracted Euro, while he does touch upon some very neat and interesting themes. From a gameplay perspective, it doesn't quite connect, and Blue Moon City is no different. Here, players are working together to rebuild the city of Blue Moon. However, they're trying to be the greatest contributor to the rebuilding project, in particular to the rebuilding of the obelisk. And you're basically doing this by moving around this board, which consists of a grid of a certain amount of tiles, representing the different buildings in Blue Moon. And each of these different buildings has one, two, or three steps towards rebuilding it. And in order to contribute to one of these steps, you need to uh, turn in cards from your hand that correspond with the color of that particular tile and also the values within those particular circles that designates those building steps. So for example, you might see a circle here that has five. In order to fulfill that step, you're going to have to turn in five yellow cards. Uh, you have a yellow circle here with two. To fulfill that step, you would have to turn in two yellow cards. And when you do, you place a player marker that represents your player color to indicate that you contributed at least once to the building of that uh, or to the building of that location. Then each player is trying to have the majority in these areas as well because at the end, when you finally complete the rebuilding of one location, you flip that tile upside down, and each player who contributed to the rebuilding of that location is going to get a reward, but the player who had the majority there will also get a reward, so that's something to factor in. You're also tapping into these neighbor rewards, because each of the different tiles, once they're completed, will benefit players who complete other tiles adjacent to them, so it kind of revs up as the game progresses, and ultimately, these rewards consist of crystals and dragon scales which eventually will give you more crystals and you're using these crystals towards the rebuilding of the obelisk which is actually your ultimate end game condition because whoever contributed the most to the rebuilding of the obelisk will be the winner of the game really cool again such a fun game to play mechanically speaking but i am not really there thinking that i am an elder or somebody a member of the council of blue moon or, or an architect of blue moon working towards its rebuilding that does not cross my mind at all but every time i play it i have a good time my number eight abstracted euro blue moon city my number seven abstracted euro is palazzo designed by reiner knizia and this game very similar to alhambra which i mentioned earlier is a tile placement game where players are using color-coded cards to purchase tiles from different markets around the table and the game here i like it more than alhambra because the tile placement is a little bit more straightforward you simply are trying to build these different buildings as many levels as as possible as high as possible ranging from one through five because the higher levels will score you points and more points than the lower level buildings will uh 
Also, you're trying to do it in sequence, so you need to get a one and then a two and then a three and then a four. And also, you're looking out for the windows because each of these different tiles have a certain amount of windows. Maybe they have one or two or three, or some of them might not even have any. And the more windows they have, the more points you will score. Finally, you're also trying to get your buildings to be in one material type. You have three different colors which represent three different materials and if your buildings are monolithic if they only consist of one material or one color then you're going to score bonus points at the end of the game so you're trying to factor all those things in but the really cool thing about this game is the market which uh, consists of four different spaces that will accumulate a certain amount of tiles as the game progresses and players when they're interested in the tiles in a particular market they will start or initiate an auction and then all the players can participate. So unlike Alhambra, every player theoretically has a chance of grabbing those tiles if they can uh, cough up the money in order to do so. Also, you have this center board in the middle of all the four markets that will also be accruing or accumulating lots of tiles along the, uh, along the way. And the value of each of those tiles is usually just 10 money. However, for each tile that's in that location, you're going to discount it by one, right? So you're, if, if you have a bunch of tiles in that location, as the game progresses, those tiles will become cheaper and cheaper. But at the same time, if you wait too long before you jump in on them, the opponent will get it at a, at a cheaper price before you do. So you have to factor all those things in. Really, really cool game. At the same time, from a thematic perspective, I don't even know what I'm doing here. What does the box say? Florence in 15th century. The city is in the midst of an artistic, cultural, and financial boom. Go figure. I would have never noticed that from playing the game. But at the same time, I'm always enjoying this game from a, th from a strategic and a gameplay perspective. My number seven, Abstracted Euro Palazzo. Now we move on to my number six, Abstracted Euro. And that is Cuba, designed by Michael Renek and Stefan Stadler. And I debated whether or not to put this or Puerto Rico, but I chose Cuba because I am in the minority in the sense that I actually prefer Cuba over Puerto Rico. Most people who play Puerto Rico don't even know what Cuba is. But this is a really cool game about producing goods and shipping them to the motherland in order to gain victory points. And basically, you have all these different ships that are at harbor, and they have a certain demand of resources uh, that you're trying to uh, supply to them for a particular value. And depending on which port they're on in the harbor, it determines how much victory points they're going to pay you for each of those resources that you contribute. And along the way, players are doing things. They're manipulating their hacienda in, for the production of certain goods. They're adding, they're doing a little bit of city building by purchasing buildings and adding it to their hacienda and these city buildings are very valuable because they trigger certain actions certain exchanges of different goods and resources additional way of scoring vi uh, victory points and in and of themselves these uh city buildings are going to be victory points for you at the end of the game and there's a really cool variable phase order that's taking place each turn where players each have five different characters to choose from and they have they have to choose four of those in each round and trigger their actions one by one in turn order but the order in which you'll do it will differ from round to round because it's all based on what's happening, what's what's the um, present situation, right? And also, you're trying to, at the end of each round, you're trying to contribute uh, a certain amount of votes towards Parliament in order to pass these particular laws. And whoever has the most votes in Parliament is going to have the advantage of choosing the laws that are in effect for the next round. And obviously, they're going to choose laws that are to their favor. So a lot of really, really cool things going on. But at the end of the day, I don't know if I feel like I'm in Cuba, uh, early 19th century, or I should say early 20th century Cuba. I don't know if I feel that when I play this game. I mean, there are some pictures that are very evocative and you do have some characters and some drawings that kind of put you into that world but other than that i'm not so sure if i feel it which is why i felt that it made perfect sense to include it as one of my abstracted euro games in particular this is number six and now we move on to the top five abstracted euros the cream of the crop and my number five abstracted euro is the poster child for abstracted euro and that is Mercator, designed by Uwe Rosenberg and published by Lookout Games. And this is Uwe Rosenberg's long-lost, forgotten stepchild. Nobody ever talks about Mercator as one of his best games, but this is a very fine design. And basically, Mercator players take on the role of merchants in Renaissance Europe, and they're traveling across the lands of Europe and also the New World. And the map 
consists of a very abstracted map of Europe, where basically the countries are depicted by these squares. And, and again, that just adds to the abstracted feel. Even more so, the resources. There are 16 different types of goods in this game. And instead of having 16 different ways to depict these goods, six, 16 different cubes or tiles that represent these goods, instead, they only have eight different color-coded uh, cubes. And each of these cubes can represent one of two resources. So that's how they represent these 16 resources or these 16 goods. And the way to distinguish these different goods is by the players and their own individual player board has different sections uh, corresponding with each of the different 16 goods. So in order to distinguish whether or not this black cube is copper versus whether or not it is iron is based on where you place that cube in your player board. So again, it just adds the abstracted feel. Now I will say this, there are some things that feel thematic about this game. For example, it does have a neat implementation of time as a currency in this game and traveling to certain parts of the world are very time consuming therefore you're gonna have to spend a lot of these time tokens in order to do so also they have this really cool mechanism where every time you move the mercator piece the merchant to a particular town it triggers or stimulates the economy of all the surrounding nations uh which i find to be a really neat idea it sounds cool like oh merchants uh traveling to town uh stimulates the economy i could see that happening so it does have some thematic flavor to it in these mechanisms but for the most part especially when it comes to the look of this game it's so easy to disconnect from what you're doing but on the surface or, or beneath the surface i should say you have a really neat pickup and delivery game with some resource management and some really cool contract fulfillment my number five abstracted euro mercator and now we move on to my number four abstracted euro and that is El Grande, and here I have the big box by Z-Man Games, and this is designed by Wolfgang Kramer and Richard Ulrich, and this is a classic at this point, the grandfather of the area majority games, and players are basically uh, in medieval Spain, and they have their grandes, and they're running their caballeros, and they're trying to have influence throughout the different regions or the provinces of Spain from a thematic perspective. I'm not feeling it. I am simply placing cubes in different locations, or in this case, meeples in different locations, in order to have the majority or maybe secondary and tertiary amounts during the scoring rounds. That's all I'm doing. Uh, but again, I like what I'm doing. Mechanically speaking, it is enjoyable. I love the action selection that takes place at the beginning of each round, and even before that, a auction for turn order that takes place so that we can determine the order in which we choose or draft these different actions. And all these different actions are really cool because they determine determine how many meeples or caballeros you get to place on the board. They also determine uh, a particular action you might take. So a more valuable um, action might give you more caballeros, but a, a weaker action, while some of the lower valued actions might give you fewer caballeros, but a really cool, interesting action that could be very helpful to you or very hurtful to your opponents. Really cool. you got the nice uh, Castillo here for uh, a memory element to it. Uh, and you got this pawn piece here that represents the king, which determines which of the regions are eligible for placement when you're placing down your caballeros. Also, you can never, under no circumstances, place one of your caballeros on the current location of the king. So that's something to factor in. Really cool, nice and neat things. I played some of the expansions here. You got the Grand Inquisitor. You got the Grandissimo expansion. And they have some really neat elements, including additional uh, areas to control, like Portugal, the Americas. You got France and Africa even that become available. So again, when you add all these expansions, there's some really cool, neat things going on. But again, I never feel like I'm doing anything related to this game besides the nice and beautiful map of Spain there's nothing else that quite that quite brings me into that world my number four abstracted euro of all time El Grande my number three abstracted euro is Seven Wonders and this is a card based civilization themed game and that kind of says it all it is so hard to really recreate all aspects of civilization 
strictly through the use of card play. And Seven Wonders does a pretty good job of doing it, but at the same time, I have to recognize its limitations from a thematic perspective. I feel like I am doing some really good, fun tableau building in this game, and I feel like I'm doing some really cool and neat uh, resource management in this game, but other than that, I don't feel like I'm building these amazing wonders, or I don't feel that I am engaging in... Uh, scientific endeavors for my times to progress my civilization. I don't feel these things. I feel like I'm doing a really good job of drafting cards, placing them in my tableau in an effective manner in order to thrive and score victory points. That is what I feel when I'm doing Seven Wonders. However, it is very enjoyable. I enjoy the process. The pick and pass card drafting mechanism really works for me. What the different cards do, there's seven different types of colors and what all of them do is very cool, very interesting. Interesting. It's neat to manage buildings that add to your culture and your civilization, your buildings that add to your science, your buildings that add to your commerce, your buildings that add to your military, the, your buildings that add to the production of your resources. It's really cool managing all those things, factoring in your neighbors, what they're doing, their military strengths, the resources they have available in order uh, for you to pay to them, uh, to use their resources. Factoring all those things in are, is just such a fun idea. Thinking about which card you're going to pick from your hand, your current hand during the pick and pass uh, is so cool because you want to get a card that's helpful to you but perhaps you also want to keep a card that might be helpful to your neighbor out of their out of their hands you want to keep it away from them also the expansions add so much i always play with the leaders and the cities expansion i quite often play with the modules from the babel expansion i still have not tried the armada expansion but it looks very cool, very neat. So yeah, all of these expansions add so much to the gameplay, but at the same time, they never really enhance it from a thematic perspective. I don't really feel like I'm building the Tower of Babel, although they have this little cool uh, board where you put... Uh, tiles on top of it and rotating it still does not feel like I'm building the Tower of Babel but I would say that I guess it's the closest thing of all the expansions to feeling thematic it's just such an enjoyable game I always have such a fun time and all these years later it's still one of my favorite games of all time and my number three abstracted euro ever seven wonders and now we move on to my number two and my number two abstract euro is Castles of Burgundy, designed by Stefan Feld and published by Ravensburger Games. And this is absolutely an abstract game. Yes, here you are, 15th century princes of the Loire Valley, devote their efforts to strategic trading and building in order to bring their estates prosperity and prominence throughout Burgundy. Sure, I am drafting tiles and placing them on my player board. That is what I'm doing. And I'm trying to complete as many areas as possible in order to score victory points. However, I do appreciate how the game gets this done or how it accomplishes from a mechanical perspective. You have two colored dice uh, corresponding with your player color that you're rolling at the beginning of each turn or each of your turns. And these dice basically determine which actions you can take. You're always going to take two actions and you have a couple actions to choose from. But the pip value of the dice that you turn in for that action determines what in particular you can do with that action. So for example, if you're trying to draft tiles from the main board, then you're going to have to draft tiles from the depot on the main board that corresponds with the pip value of the die you just turned in. If you're trying to place a tile that you already have in your reserve onto your estate, then on the particular hex hex hexagon space that you're trying to place that tile on, you need to turn in a die that matches the pip value that's printed on that hex. So you're factoring all these things in. And you have these worker tiles which you can acquire throughout the game and these worker tiles basically serve as dice mitigation. They're ways to modify your dice rolls. You can always spend these to increase or decrease the value of your dice by one. You can roll a six over to a one and vice versa. So they're a very valuable resource. At the same time they're a hot commodity so it's not the easiest to get them. You, you do have to basically sacrifice a action in order to draft additional worker tiles so you got to budget them wisely and um, choose when it's the best uh, most optimal situation in order to use them but they're very very helpful to give you a sense of control so again really cool mechanically speaking there's a lot of cool things going on as far as you trying to fill the different sections of your player grid is concerned you have these city buildings that give you special one-time abilities you got uh your 
um, knowledge buildings, which are kind of like your technology, and they give you more long-term benefits and sometimes additional ways of scoring points at the end of the game. Lots of really cool things going on, but at the end of the day, I do not feel like I'm in Burgundy. My number two, Abstracted Euro, the Castles of Burgundy. And now we move on to my number one abstracted game. And this is not necessarily the most abstracted game out of all in these lists. An argument can be made that it's the most thematic of all of these. But at the same time, I couldn't justify putting this on my top 10 thematic Euros list. So I chose to put it here because it is my favorite of all of these games. It's number one. And that is Kingsburg. And in Kingsburg, basically, you are working to win over the favor of different court officials ranking from as high as the king and the queen all the way as low as the court jester and basically when you win the favor of these different court officials they grant you certain benefits sometimes in the form of resources like gold stone and wood primarily sometimes in the form of victory points or sometimes even in the form of strengthening your military and you need to have that military strong because at the end of each year at the end of each round represented by the winter phase of each round you are going to have a different fantastical uh, army or horde of creatures attacking your section of the city of Kingsburg. And if you do not have the strength in order to combat against them, then they're going to have their loot and they're going to cause you some casualties. So that's something to factor in. Sometimes that could be the loss of victory points or the loss of resources, which are very hard to come by. So you're doing all this, but at the same time, mechanically speaking, this is just a worker placement game, a dice placement game where you're work rolling dice at the beginning of each round and you're using those dice in order to place them uh, on particular uh, court officials and they each have a different uh, rank. So they have a different amount, a different value amount that your dice has to equal to in order to place it there. And sometimes you might choose to place your dice on multiple lower valued officials or you might combine them into two or three in order to hit target or hit one of those higher ranked officials and get their benefit. And you're doing all this and you're doing a little bit of city building on the side. You have your own individual player board which consists of a five by four grid of different buildings. If you use the expansion then you have a seven by four grid. And you have all these different buildings that grant you different benefits and ultimately victory points at the end of the game. But it's really cool because the way you build them in order to build um, buildings in column two, three, or four, you always have to have the buildings immediately to their left having already been completed. So you cannot jump to any building on your grid. You kind of have to gradually work your way through there. And I appreciate that limitation because it adds to the thoughtfulness and the strategy uh, early on in the game. So again, all these things feel really, really cool. The things that the buildings do are interesting. They allow you to strengthen your military uh, or perhaps they strengthen your military against particular races or perhaps they allow you to mitigate your dice roll or have an additional way of exchanging for resources very valuable in many regards but at the end of the day when i play this game i don't necessarily feel like i'm in this medieval fantastical setting i just feel like i'm playing a really cool and neat worker placement or dice placement game and that it very much is very fun game i recommend it to anybody my number one abstracted euro of all time kingsburg and that's it for today's list folks Comment down below. Tell me what you think about this list. Perhaps these games were not as abstracted as you thought they would be. Uh, perhaps you don't agree with their ranking. I'm interested in reading what you guys have to say. This is Harry saying take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun gaming. Bye-bye.